Look at someone near you, say, I'm glad you came. <clears throat> I believe all of us could be encouraged this morning, amen? All of us could be encouraged this morning. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, please, church, to John chapter 10. John chapter 10 is where we're going to begin together this morning in the Word of God. John chapter 10. And if you're here today and you do not have a Bible, the, the Scripture will be on the screen in front of you in just a moment. And if you do not have a Bible at home, please see myself or one of the gentlemen at the door when you leave, and we want to be a blessing and give you one completely free, no strings attached. But the Word of God has every answer to life. Can you say amen to that, church? The Word of God has every answer that you will ever need in your life. John chapter 10, verse 1, we're going to read for a moment and circle back around and talk about it. Jesus, speaking in the text, says the following. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door but climbs in by another way, that man is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Amen. To him, the gatekeeper opens. The, the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. And when he has brought out all his own, he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice. A stranger they will not follow, but they will flee from him for they do not know the voice of strangers. This figure of speech Jesus used with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So Jesus again said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Multiple times in this teaching, Jesus called himself the door. In the ninth verse, Jesus says, look at it, John 10, 9. In the ninth verse, Jesus says, I am the door. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be what, church? Saved. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved. Look at your neighbor and say, that's us. Now, listen closely, friends. Jesus, because I want to make this clear, Jesus is the only door to heaven. There's no other way. There's no other path. There's no other doors. There's, there's no other options. Jesus Christ is the only door into heaven. He's the only door that when we come to God, we come to God through Christ, that open door. He's the only door that we get to spend eternity, eternity with, with God. He's it. Everybody say there's no other options. No other options. <laughs> Write this down if you're taking notes, church. Jesus Christ is the, and capitalize the word the, Jesus Christ is the door. There's no other option. Now today we're going to talk about doors. And I don't know if you've ever paid attention to this in Scripture or not, if it's ever popped out to you or not, but Scripture is loaded with references to doors. Loaded with references to doors. And so I just figure this, if it's constantly mentioned, then it must be of importance and value. Amen? What, why does Jesus... Always talk about doors. And, and, and here's what's really neat about it. It's not just Jesus Christ that talks about doors. He must have taught it so much that even the apostles continue to reference doors in their teaching. And so we're going to talk about doors. There's many different types of doors that Scripture mentions about. Obviously, church, we're not going to get through all of them here today, but we're going to do some of them together. I'll write this down if you're taking notes. I'm going to give you a certain, just a handful of doors that we, we may find ourselves speaking about today. Uh, here they go. Jesus is the door to life. Can we say amen to that? Jesus is the door to life. 
Here's another one, and we're going to look at quite a few of these today. God offers people doors of opportunity. We're going to see that in Scripture. Okay, that's scriptural. We're going to see doors of opportunity. Write this one down. Doors of ministry. That's scriptural. We'll see where that actual term is used in the word of God. Doors of ministry. Okay. So we've got a door to life. We've got doors of opportunity. We've got doors of ministry. And of course, Satan offers people doorways of temptation. Anybody ever seen those doors before? Go and raise your hand. Let people know they're not by themselves. How many people have walked through those doors before? I have. Raise your hand. Let people know by yourself. You can look around and see who's lying in church by not raising their hand. You know you've been through that door. You know what that door looks like. You know what that door frame looks like. You've probably scuffed up against it a few times. Now, we've all seen the door of temptation. And we've all fallen and gone through the door of temptation, unfortunately. And Satan offers doorways. There's, there's doors of temptation. Write this down. There's, there's doors of destruction. There's doors that lead to destruction. And with that in mind, I want you to go to Revelation chapter 3. And don't get nervous because you're going to the book of Revelation. How many people know that Revelation is the book that just continues to let us know that our team wins? And the reason you don't have to be fearful of dying, the reason you don't have to be fearful of the turmoil that this world, the wreck of the, uh, 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 of the position that this world finds itself in, you don't have to be upset about it. I mean, pray about it, but I'm just telling you, the Bible lets us know things are going to get worse. But the good news is, is that Revelation lets us know that God is in control. Jesus Christ is the king. He's on his throne and he's coming to take us home. Can you say amen to that? Amen. And so I don't get worked up about politics. The Bible says that we're to pray, that we're to pray for the people in charge. And we should and we should pray for our political leaders on both sides of the aisle and people in between. But I've got no fear over it. And the Bible tells me that the government is on my king's shoulders. That's what it says. The government is on my king's shoulders, my king Jesus, your king Jesus. And so we don't have to get worried about it. Revelation lets us know that we win. And that should give us great peace. Amen. It should give us tremendous peace, peace beyond understanding. Revelation chapter three. We're going to begin with the 20th verse for a moment. Look there, if you will, please, church. Revelation chapter three. Verse 20. Jesus speaking in the text, behold, I stand at the what? And we're going to talk about this door for a moment. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If who? Anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Verse 21, the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Stop right there for a moment. Um, Jesus, let's just talk about what, what's going on here. Jesus is speaking here in the text, and most people think, or most people might think, that Jesus was speaking of a door of salvation, but he's not. And the reason a lot of people think that Jesus is speaking of a door of salvation is because a lot of people use this verse as a salvation verse, and that's fine and well. That's fine and well, but the truth of the matter is Jesus in this text is not speaking to unsaved people. Jesus is writing this letter through John to who? A church. And matter of fact, it's a church that thinks they got it going on, but they don't. And Jesus kind of like whips them into shape. We'll get into it in just a moment, but Jesus kind of whips them into shape through this letter. And he actually says, if anyone, if anyone listens... In other words, the whole church may not, but if anyone in the church wants to, let me just say this, God can do big things through a willing individual. Amen. Write that down if you're taking notes. God can do big things through a willing individual. So he says, if anyone, everybody say if anyone, if anyone. And so this is a big deal. This is a really big deal. The truth is, Jesus, Jesus will rescue and save anyone. Amen. Jesus will rescue and save anyone who responds to the Holy Spirit by knocking at the door of their heart. And that's the truth of the matter. But I want to get into the text of the verse. I want to get into the context, the content of what's going on here. Jesus is, again, not speaking to the unsaved in this particular moment. He's speaking to the church. 
Let's take a look at it. Revelation 3.14, because in order to see it, we got to back up just a moment in the letter. Revelation chapter 3, verse 14. And to the angel of the church in Laodicea, write, okay, the words of the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of God's creation. Here it goes, this letter to the church. Now, just imagine for a moment if Jesus was writing this to you. Here it is. I know your works. Again, he's speaking to the church. You are neither cold nor hot. Would that you were either cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing, not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, oh, this is so beautiful, church, verse 19. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Let me just say this. We'll close out the letter in verse 22. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit, capital S, the Holy Spirit of God. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. You know, that's one of my biggest prayers for everyone in this room, that people in this church would have an ear to be sensitive to what the Holy Spirit wants to do in here. And not just in here, but in your lives when you leave here. Jesus is giving this church a church-wide letter, and you can only imagine how many Many of them, if not all of them, are feeling as he's calling them out onto the carpet for their sin and disobedience. And look at what he says in the 19th verse. Go back to it, Revelation 3.19. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and what? Repent. He says, if, if, if I reprove you, if I, if I discipline you, just know that I love you. I love you. I, I'm not just going to go let you live recklessly. Why? Because I love you. And then comes the 20th verse to the church. Look at it. He says, behold, I stand at the door. The door of the church. The door of their hearts. The door of opportunity. Behold, I, I stand at the door and knock if anyone hears my voice and opens the door. And I will come into him and eat with him and, and he with me. Jesus, write this down. Jesus is offering a door of opportunity to that church. He's offering them a door of opportunity to get right. He's offering them a door of opportunity to repent. He's offering them a door of opportunity to walk in obedience. How many people could say, thank God for another door of opportunity in your life? Oh, my goodness, what a blessing that we can restart sometimes. Amen, church? He's, he's offering them. He's offering them a door of opportunity. Those who are walking off course, those who are missing the mark, and maybe, just maybe there's some people in the room this morning, I'm speaking to you in this particular moment, that you feel exactly like that. That at one point you were walking really close with God. You, you had this amazing relationship with Jesus Christ and you were in your word and you were praying like you never prayed before. You were spending quiet time with God and you were desiring and listening and hearing from his Holy Spirit. And then, and then you begin to get off mark a little bit. Just a little bit. And then a little bit grew to a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and then it began to change your lifestyle a little. Now something special takes place when you go from the 20th verse to the 21st verse, and I want to look at it together. Look at Revelation 3.20. I, I want to show you something that happens in this, in this coming back piece with Jesus. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, say it with me, church, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Keep going. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me 
on my throne. Keep going. As I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. Man, there's something, there's something going on in this piece right here that is so good. If, if we can get back to the, to the 21st verse again, if we can get that up there again, because the truth is everyone didn't read that, and some people that read it weren't excited about it. So I'm just not released to give you what I'm excited about yet, because you're not there. Some of you aren't there yet. All right, we're going to read it out loud on the count of three, and I want you to read it like you want to be here. Amen? One, two, three, go. The one who... Man, this is really cool. Go back to the 20th verse for a moment. Watch this. Verse 20. Read this out loud. Ready? One, two, three, go. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and will sup with him. You want to know what's really amazing about those two verses? I mean, really, really cool. Pay close attention. When we, when we walk with Christ in obedience... God takes us from one place to another. And I'm about to show you that through this scripture in just a moment, but, but can I just bring something up before we get there? Jesus uses the term to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. He, he goes from talking to a church that was once doing it really well, and then they get off track, and to the church, to individuals, he says, if, if anyone if anyone at this point is willing to wake up in here, if anyone at this point is willing to wake up at this door I'm knocking on, if, if anyone's willing to wake up at this opportunity to repent, I'll forgive you right now. Everybody say, if anyone. If anyone. Look at your neighbor and say, that's us too. That's us too. Right? If, 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 if anyone is willing to repent, thank God he hears. So he goes from saying, if anyone, and, and this is really neat, he says, to the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. Can I, just, can I just get your attention for a minute? Everybody listen here. You got to finish strong. You got to finish strong. We cannot be like a dog that returns to its vomit, as Scripture talks about. We cannot be ones that Paul talks about that return to their old ways of living, to their old prior idolatry. We, 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 we cannot do that. We've got to be able to finish strong. So in the 20th verse, if you look at it, it says, Behold, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him. Everybody say, Eat with Christ. Eat with Christ. Okay. And he with me. Now watch this. Okay, so come in and eat with him and he with me. Now watch this, verse 21. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my what? Yeah. Write this down. We go from the supper room to the throne room. That's where we belong. On earth, we belong in the supper room. That's one of, the, that's one of my most favorite, uh, one, of, one of my most biggest reasons I love Thursday night church and Sunday morning church is because those are what I call family nights. That's when the family should all come together. You know, not everybody's going to go to the men's group. Not everybody's going to go to the women's group. Not everybody's going to go to the youth group. But man, there are but two nights that we should all know that family comes together. And that's in those living room moments. When all of the family can get into a room and we can get into the presence of God together and everybody's invited in one place to receive from the Lord. That's the supper room. This is, in a sense, your supper room. We're, we're here supping. We're here, we're here eating on the word. Amen. We're here eating on the word. We're, we're, we're here together to grow in Christ together and to encourage one another together and to support one another together. This is a living room moment. This is a family room moment, if you want to call it a dining room moment. We're in the supper room of God in this particular moment. I've, I've, I've sought God for the message. I've been on my face. I've been on my hands. I've been on my knees. And God has spoke clearly to me to speak to you this message about this door. And I've received from the Holy Spirit. 
And then, and then throughout the week, can I just encourage you, throughout the week, you should be praying for this moment too. You should be praying. Can I just ask for your prayers? Can I covet your prayers for a moment? You should be praying, Father, give Pastor Lee the message that he needs for us this week. God, I pray, pray for my protection, pray for my blessing, pray that the Holy Spirit would speak to me and that I would get fresh wind and fresh word like a fresh manna from the Father. I, I implore you, please, I covet your prayers, pray for me. But you should also be praying for you. God, I'm excited about this week. I'm going into that living room. I'm going into that dining room. I'm going into that house this week, your house, Father. And I want to receive a word that can change my life. It can change my way of thinking. It can change my way of feeling. It can change my way of living. Can I just tell you, don't ever come to church just to come here. You see, that's what the devil wants. He wants you to just come to church just to come. I don't want you to do that. I don't want you to come to church just to come. And maybe some people are nervous. Oh, my goodness, he's telling people don't come back to church. Ain't nobody going to come back. They don't want to... I got better hopes for you than that. I'm praying for you better than that. I, I'm, I'm asking God, grow us all up together. I, I don't want to come here and just preach. I don't want to come. Look, there's books I can buy that can show me what to say and sermon outlines you can purchase. I'm, not, I, I'm, I'm going beyond that. God, you give me a word that your people need to hear now. And as I'm praying that, you should be praying. That's my job. Here's your job as, as the flock. Your job is to say, oh, Lord, open my ears this week. Make me tuned in this week so that I can hear clearly when I get into that family room. This is family time, and this is why we're here together to grow together. So he goes, he goes from that supper room and Jesus says, for those who conquer, will sit with me in the throne room. I don't know about you, but I long to be in the throne room. But you know what gets me to the throne room? Here it goes. Some people may not like to hear this because they got things to do on the weekend. Here it goes. What gets you and me to the throne room is being in the supper room. <laughs> See, the last thing God needs is malnourished Christianity. The last thing God needs is malnourished Christians running around with a concept thinking that what they've done is enough. Now, I'm not preaching works, but a faith without works is what? That's what the word says. Oh, you, could, you could write it down like this. The supper room takes me to the upper room. The supper room takes me to the upper room. Oh, my goodness. Whew. You know you can kind of have those upper room moments right here on this earth. Yeah. Whew, man. You can, you can have those upper room moments. When, when I was younger, there was a church that I attended, and they had a prayer room upstairs. And they had this long table with benches. And for those that wanted to get there early before service, you could go up there and you could pray. And I'm going to tell you, man, I, I love going up there with the grown people that knew how to pray, man. And I'm not saying young people don't. It's just it was, it was never really young people up there praying. So, so as a young person, I would go up there and I'd be around these, 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 uh, these older people and, and they, would just, they would just be praying. And around that table, man, in that particular room that was dedicated just for prayer, it just reminded me of an upper room experience at that particular time in my life, and I needed that time in my life. I needed that time in my life. We've, we've, we've made in our house at home, Erica and I have made a quiet place in our home, and that's what we do in that room. We, we, we pray, we, we, we read, we've got some chairs that we can go sit in and just be quiet. The other day I found her in there. I thought I was going to go in there and see her studying. She was eating a bowl of ice cream. I say, I say, I'm going to tell you, man, this room is really spiritual. <laughs> to be fair, to be fair, she was, she was listening to a Christian. She was listening to a sermon. All right, so, so, so while she was listening, she, she had her ice cream. To be fair, she had that. But she was, she was, she was, she was doing one better. She was, she was causing her, her husband not to stumble because I'm, I'm watching what I eat right now and my sugar intake. And so she had to take her, cho her bowl of chocolate sugar and hide it in the... <laughs> In the prayer room. <laughs> yeah. 
but we've created a space. <laughs> that's all. Oh, that's that's true. We've we've created a space. We've created a space in, in in our house where we can go seek the Lord in a particular room, and and people will know that that's what we're doing when we're in there. We're in our Word. We're hearing from God. Don't don't come in here with problems. Don't come in here with life's problems in this room. Wait till I get out of the room. Have enough respect to let me get out of the room. We're, we're asking, and I'm asking God for an upper room moments in that room. If I want to get to the throne room, I've got to spend time in that supper room. How many people know that God wants you to commune with him? He, he, he wants you spending time with him. He, he wants to take you from one level of faith to the next, one level of glory to the next. Amen, church? And so he wants, he wants to grow us in that supper room so that we can get in right standing and be with him in that upper room, that throne room. I want to talk about a particular door that Paul talks about. We're going to, we're going to shift it a little bit. I, I wanted to, you know, I felt led to open this morning about Jesus saying that he is the door. That, that, that's the most important door. Amen. But I want to talk to you about a door that Paul brings into play here in the ministry. Uh, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 16 in your Bibles, if you will, for a moment, please. By going to Revelation chapter 3, um, that we just read, the reason I felt like the Lord was pulling that up for this morning was simply because it's showing a church that, 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 that wasn't perfect, and there's no perfect church down here, amen? But the beauty is, is that truly, as I mentioned earlier, maybe there's some people in this room that just feel like you're not cutting it, and maybe you have walked away, and I just want to encourage you in the Lord and say, be okay today in Christ. Be okay today in Christ. And come through the door again. 1 Corinthians 16. And we're going to look at the fifth verse. <clears throat> when you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. Ready to grow. 1 Corinthians 16. 1 Corinthians 16. 16 verse 5. 1 Corinthians 16 verse 5. Here we go, church. The word of God present to the Lord says this. Paul in his letter, I will visit you after passing through Macedonia, for I intend to pass through Macedonia, and perhaps I will stay with you or even spend the winter so that you may help me on my journey wherever I go. For I do not want to see you now just in passing. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits, but I will stay in Ephesus until Pentecost. For a wide door, everybody say wide door. For a wide door, here's the type of door. For a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Wow, there's a lot going on here. Paul mentions a wide door of ministry. Write that down if you're taking notes. A wide door of ministry. Man, that excites me. A wide door of ministry. But notice he said in the ninth verse, a wide door for effective work has opened to me and there are many what? Adversaries. Isn't that interesting? See, everything may not go as smoothly as we hoped. Amen. It, just because God opens a door doesn't mean there's not going to be the enemy with a foot in front of it trying to trip us up or keep us from getting in. But listen, let me just encourage you, when God opens a door for you to go through, as long as you trust in God and the power of the Holy Spirit, nothing can keep you from going through it but you yourself. You yourself. So he mentions a wide door for effective work that God has opened to me, and he says, there are how many adversaries? Many. Many adversaries. Now understand this, church. Write this down. Listen closely. Where God wants to sow seeds, the devil tries to sow weeds. Where God wants to sow seeds, you know the enemy's going to show up. Where God wants to sow seeds, the enemy is going to try to be there to sow weeds. I believe God has called me to encourage each of you this morning to begin looking. 
Now, let me, give you, let me give you the reason why I believe God has called me to give you this message on doors this morning. I believe God wants each of you this morning to begin looking and praying to see the doors that God has placed in front of you in your life. See, because before, before if we did not understand these doors and opportunities, salvation, ministry, works, we, we may have just not understood what they were, but the more we begin to see the word doors in the Bible, we begin to understand these are important things. And as Christians and as the church, we should be looking for doors of ministry, doors of opportunities to serve the kingdom of God. Doors of opportunity to honor God. And like Paul, opportunities, he says, to serve him. Doors of God that we do not want to miss. Doors of God that not only we don't want to miss, doors of God that we don't want to pass by, whether it be on purpose or not. Because the truth is, every one of us in this room just about has probably passed by doors of opportunity simply because we didn't want to devote our time, effort, and energy, and resources towards it. Write this down if you're taking notes. Don't turn down God's doors. Not if they're meant for you to go through. Not if... I mean, for you to go, to, go through. Uh, Billy, Graham, Billy Graham once said this. So let me just say this about doors. Billy Graham said that uh, there was a time in his ministry. He wrote about that there was a time in his ministry where doors were flinging open left and right. And he was traveling all over the world. So much so that when one of his little children was outside and an airplane went across and they were just, you know, they had a little bit of vocabulary and everything. An uh, airplane goes across and one of his little children looks up and says, Daddy. Because that's what they associated their daddy with, because he was always gone from home. Billy Graham says, he says, there were so many open doors that I was going through, he said, but the truth is, is that I probably went through doors I never should have went through. By Billy Graham's own confession, he went through more doors than what he should have went through. And here's what he said why he did it. He said, because doors were flinging open so fast for our ministry, he said, we were going through doors before we even prayed whether we should go through them or not. So before you go through a door of opportunity, before you go through a door of ministry, you should pray, God, is this, is this my door of opportunity? Is this my door of ministry? Is this, is this my door that you want me to walk through? Because it could be a good door, but it doesn't mean it's your door. Hear that now. It could be a good door, but it doesn't mean it's your door to go through. Colossians chapter 4, go there with me if you will in Scripture. Can I just tell you this while you're turning there? This is the reason we need to be careful and we need to pray about doors because how many people know that just about everything God does, Satan tries to emulate? I mean, we even see that coming right up to the end of times with the false prophet and just different things, the way things are set up into Jerusalem. But so much of what God does, Satan tries to emulate, which is why we need to be careful because when we started this morning, I shared with you that God has doors, but Satan has doors too. Satan has doors too. Colossians chapter 4. And we're going to begin with a second verse. When you're there, say, I'm ready to grow. grow. Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Watch what happens here. Continue. Everybody say, keep going. Continue steadfastly in what church? Prayer. Prayer. Being watchful in it. Being watchful in your times of prayer. Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a what? A door. What's this door open for? The word. word. At the same time, verse 3, at the same time, pray also for us that that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison. Verse 4, pay close attention. He says, verse 4, he writes, that I may make it clear, talking about the word, that I may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. See, here we see Paul again praying for a door of ministry to open. How many people in this room, let, let, let me just take a quick survey here. 
for the benefit of all of us in this room to encourage one another. How many people in this room have prayed before for someone to understand a verse that you wanted to share with them in hopes that it would draw them closer to God and what they were going through in life? Raise your hand if that's you. If you tried to share a verse with someone, okay, put your hand down for a moment. Can I encourage you to begin praying for not just the understanding of the individual, because oftentimes that's the first thing that we go through. Lord, let them understand. Lord, let them understand. But can, can I encourage you to do what Paul is asking his brethren to do? Can, can I encourage you to not just pray for the understanding of the individual, but to also pray for the timing to be right? Because can I, can I just tell you this? You can have a knowledge and you can have a wisdom, but if you don't have the right season, it ain't going to grow. You can have a knowledge and you can have a wisdom, but if you don't have the right season, it's not going to grow. Listen, let me explain it in a really simple uh, term. You can have a good tomato seed from a really good produce, from a really good uh, situation that's going on with the soil. Everything could just be right. You could be out there watering it, but you step out there into that garden and till that ground in January and tell me how that plant grows. See, you, 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 you had something good and, 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 and you had good soil and, and you were watering. But if you get out of season, you won't see no fruit. And I think sometimes as Christians, right, that's, that's where we miss it. We spend more time going to our loved ones and just trying to hit them all over the head with Scripture, you know. That, God says, God says, God says, God says. God says. Psh, 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 psh. Lord, let them understand. You know the word says, bada, 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 bada. and you're living in sin. You're living in sin. You're living in sin. You're living in sin. God says, God says you ought to do this, and then you be blessed. God, and listen, it all may be good seed that you're sowing, but if you haven't spent time praying for the right season, you won't see fruit from that seed. If you try to step in front of the season of what the Holy Spirit wants to work, you will not see fruit from that seed. So before we get a word, a knowledge, and a wisdom, let's begin praying for the right season. Because I want, if I'm going to minister to someone, I want their heart to be right. If, if, if I'm going to get anybody's ear, I want to make sure that the ear makes connection to the heart. I don't want the ear to make just direct connection to the mind alone because that's when you'll begin to fight with an individual verbally. Disagreements or hardened hearts. I want an ear that's connected to the heart. And here's why. Because scripture says that the heart of a man is sick. So I need the word to go in the ear and land in the spiritual heart of a man. So I need there to be a connection. And I'm not saying that you can't invite them to church. I'm not saying that you can't encourage them. I'm not saying that you can't love on them like Christ and forgive them and show mercy and grace. All those things we should be doing all the time anyway. Can you say amen, church? All those times we should do it. But if you come with a rebuke or a stern correction, you better make sure that the season is ready for that seed. If you want to see fruit. See, now what you can do at all times, let me, just, let me just follow it up with this. What you can do at all times, see, it's always a season to love people. It's always a season to show Christ to people. Amen? It's always a season to forgive people. Amen? It's always a season to show mercy and grace to people. It's always a season to be an ambassador of, of Christ to people. Amen, church? But man, when we, and listen, it's always the season. Let me just say this. It's always the season to give a word of encouragement. It's always the season to take the word of God and build somebody up. But if you go in with a seed that could possibly rebuke and tear down so that it can be built up, you better pray and make sure that it's the season of breaking down and building up. Because if you go in a season and just break down, all you're going to leave is rubble on the ground. All you're going to leave. And I just feel that by the Holy Spirit to share that with some people in here today. All you're going to leave is some broke down material and it's not a season of rebuilding in their life. And then what? Then the enemy moves in and he says, I'll be the general contractor on this job, Christian. You get on out of here. Now you done made them mad and you done made them emotional. And now they're crying and now they're upset. Write this down. The season is important 
to the seed. The seed is the word. You know, the, the scripture tells us that the word is seed. Amen? So the word, the seed, gets in us and should be producing fruit. Now, can, can, can I just say this? Because what we don't need is husbands and wives to go home today and someone say, hey, you need to get out there and cut that grass this evening. It's gotten too tall and you went fishing yesterday. And what we don't need is the husband to look at the wife and say, this ain't the season for that seed. <laughs> don't go home taking out of context what I'm trying to teach you spiritually. This ain't the season for that seed. Because then she may look at you when it's dinner time and, and you say, hey, sweetie, what's for dinner? She said, it ain't the season for that seed either. <laughs> the wrong season. <laughs> and then you say, it's cold tonight. <laughs> We're living in September, but it feels like the midst of January. Some of y'all know it's true. There's two things that Paul is asking for, and, and we can't move on this morning until we see, because this is so important, this is vital to it. There's two things Paul is asking for for prayer uh, in this particular passage. Write these two things down if you're taking notes, church. And Oh, man, may the Lord, may the Holy Spirit just inscribe them upon our hearts. There's two things here. Number one, this is what he's asking in prayer, if you remember the text. Number one, God opened the door of opportunity. That's what he's saying. Pray that God opens the door of opportunity. God opens the door of the word for the word. And so he's asking his brethren, pray for me. Do you see how important it is that we ask Christians to pray for one another? That maybe have family that are struggling? Oh, would you just pray that I could hear clearly, please, brother, sister, that, that when it's time to approach them in the due season, that, that I take the word and the knowledge, the wisdom and the seed, and, and I go plant it in the right season because I don't want to go too early and I don't want to go too late. You know, if you go too early, if you go too early with your garden, I've seen people out there with 50 buckets on top of tomato plants. Because what's coming that night? The frost. I know what they're thinking, though. I'm going to beat the heat. And start early. But by beating the heat and starting early, you're competing with the frost. You're, you're producing, you're trying to start out of season to produce a fruit. And it takes more work, doesn't it? It takes more work. Spiritually, spiritually, we've got to understand that, that we're to be faithful, but the Holy Spirit is to do the work. And can I just tell you this? The Holy Spirit does not work out of season. The Holy Spirit, write that down, the Holy Spirit does not work out of season. The Holy Spirit is not going to get in front of the step of God. He won't do it. He won't do it. They're in unity. Man, there is an anointing here this morning. There is a unity and there is a, there is a one accord. They are three in one. Can we say amen to that? The Holy Spirit's not going to step out of season. He's, he's not going to jump in front of the word of God, the will of God. He won't do it. He won't do it. Number two. Well, number one, again, open, God opened the door of opportunity. That's what he's asking for prayer for. And then the second thing in that, in that passage he's asking for prayer for, number two, God help me speak clearly. And sometimes I think we get a word and we've got wisdom and we've got a point and we go make it. But do we ask God to help us speak clearly? Lord, I'll... I, I'm asking that you help me speak clearly and let me only say what you permit me to say. Yeah, I pray that. I pray that before I come into this room. I pray that, Lord, I don't want to say anything other than what you want me to say. If I share jokes, if I, feel, if, if I share personal stories, Lord, whatever it is, humor, whatever it is, Lord, I don't want to go beyond where you want me to take it to bring your people and get their attention. So I just want to speak and share what you want me to speak and share. God, may the words that come out of my mouth just be what you've permitted and you've permitted alone. We should, we should pray that we speak and speak clearly. Speak and speak clearly. Speak and speak clearly. I, I pray that one of the anointings that God has on my life will always remain, and that is, here's my desire. When I preach to you, I don't want to overcomplicate it. I want to simplify it. 
So that whether someone's been saved for a hundred years or someone's yet to be saved, every person between them and in between can still understand the gospel message of Jesus Christ. Lord, help me speak, but help me speak clearly so that people can understand. So he says, God opened, he says to the brethren, pray for this. Number one, God opened the door of opportunity. Number two, God helped me speak clearly. Now listen, those two things should be something that we're praying. And if we're not already, I implore you in the love of Christ, add these things to your prayer time in the morning. God opened doors of opportunity for ministry today. God opened the door for your word today. And God Almighty, help me speak, but not just speak. Father, help me speak clearly by your Holy Spirit's power. See, when the time is right, when the time is right, everybody said when the time is right. Remember, the season's got to be in. When the time is right, I want to speak clearly the word of God, and you should desire, too, to speak clearly the word of God that the Holy Spirit will use to penetrate their hearts and their minds for Christ Jesus. Go to Acts 14, 24 for a moment in your Bibles. Let's keep moving. Acts 14. I'm going to show you a different type of door that's mentioned. Acts 14, 24. We've talked about a door of faith, a door of opportunity, a door of word, a door for the word, a door of works, serving. And I want to show you a different type of door here. Acts 14, and look at the 24th verse, please, church. Acts 14, 24, praise God, says this. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. And when they had spoken the word in Perga, they went down to Italia. And from there they sailed to Antioch, where they had been commended to the grace of God for the work that they had fulfilled. Amen. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them. See, they're giving their testimony to the church and how he had opened a door of what? I want to talk to you about a door of faith for a moment. Look at it, verse 27. And when they arrived and gathered the church together, they declared all that God had done with them and how he had opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Now look at what happened there. And understand that the same thing, the same thing can happen for your husband. Can you say amen? I want you to see what happened here. There's a door of faith opened up and many people came, came to Christ that were not believing, did not know about, and refuted. And many people have, have come to Christ. The same thing, ladies, can, can happen to your husbands. Husbands, the same thing can happen to your wife. It can happen to your children. It can happen to your grandchildren. It, it can happen to your friends. It can happen to your co-workers. Amen. Whoever it is that you're trying to lead to Christ. Paul and Barnabas said in the 27th verse, mark that down as a reference, Acts 14, 27 now, I want you to go home and read about it. I want you to go home and pray about it. Acts 14, 27 Paul and Barnabas are saying this. This is their testimony. This is their testimony. God has opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. He's opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. Isn't it something? I mean, we've just touched on a few references to doors of things, and I'm just telling you, it's loaded, it's loaded, it's loaded in Scripture. He's opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Now, let me just say this. Begin praying God's Word back to Him. How many people know that works? That honors God. Can I just say that? When you learn the Word, and you study it, and you pray it back, it honors God. In 1 Samuel 2, uh, 2.30 right here, a light verse on top of my head, for those who honor God, He says, I will honor you. For those who honor me, he says, I will honor you in return. But those who despise me, God says, I will disdain. That's the latter half of that verse. I don't know about you. I'd rather be in honor than disdained. So we should, we should begin praying, God, may the season be right. God, work on them. But God, speak to me. And God, work on me. And, and Father, I'm praying for this window. I'm praying for this door of faith, as he calls it, this door of faith for my fill-in-the-blank. I, I, I'm asking, Father, 
Just as Paul and Barnabas had this door of faith open, the Gentiles had this door of faith open for them. I'm asking that my husband, my wife, my children, my boss, my grandchildren, my friends, my co-workers, my community, those in the church that may be saved and not living right, I'm asking that a door of faith be opened. Can I just tell you this? When the door of faith opened to the Gentiles, the church, the New Testament church exploded. It exploded. There was a door that opened up. Watch this, that no man could shut. My door of faith has been opened and can't nobody close it on me. I've walked through the door of salvation, Jesus, and no one can shut it on me. Amen? I'm, I'm praying for even more doors of opportunity for more doors of service to honor God. And listen, I've just got enough faith to tell you, no man can shut it on me. There's no demon, there's no demonic force that can close it in my face. And that's what I'm believing, that's what I'm standing on, for doors of opportunity. I'm, I'm praying for doors of opportunity of the word to go out. Doors for the word to go out. And, and these are things that we see happening in the New Testament church, which is what we're living in today. And we're studying it right here in the word of God together. Amen. So we need to begin praying these, these things back to God. Lord, you did it for them. You can do it for me. God, you opened that door for them. I believe you opened it for me. You, you opened it. You opened it for the Gentile nation. I know you can open it for my crazy uncle so-and-so. If you open it for those people, I know, I know you'll open it for grandpa or whoever. Listen, I don't care how mean he is, how ugly he is, or how mean he is, or how ugly she is. I've got a God that can open a door of faith that can make grown people break. That can make hard people hit their knees. That can make hard hearts crumble. Hallelujah. I, I, I serve a God. You have a God. You serve a God. That when a door of faith is opened up, it can make atheists bow before the king and confess Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Write this down if you're taking notes. There's nothing impossible. Nothing impossible through Christ for my family. There's nothing impossible through Christ with my family, for my family. How many people know he can do all things? And because he can, we can through him. Because he can, we can through him. Amen, church? Can we give God a clap of praise? He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. He's so worthy. I, I want to show you, I want to show you what happened at this open door of faith that Paul is speaking about, man. Because there was some intense things that a lot of people, if we would have seen it, and we, we get to that door in life and we say, whoa, I, I don't want to walk through that door. I think I'm going to go choose a much comfortable a more comfortable door. I don't know that I like that door, God. I mean, that looks intense. Have you ever come home from work and you open the door of your home and you just feel tension in your house? And I know what you do. The first thing you're probably thinking is, I'm going to shut the door and go to the neighbors. Let me say, anybody ever thought to yourself, I wish I'd have just stayed at work? Yeah, I should have just stayed home. I should have stayed at work. I shouldn't have come home. I should have worked overtime. We need overtime. I should have worked overtime. <laughs> you, you walk into a room and you're just like, oh, no. This is worse than where I just come from. <laughs> I didn't know it could get any worse. I'm going to show you a door that probably quite, quite a bit of us would have thought the same thing if we'd have walked through it. And here we see Paul and Barnabas, we see these brothers rejoicing over this door, right? And so we're thinking, man, this must be a great door. This, this, this must be a really good door, right? I mean, they're, they're celebrating. They're talking about door of faith, right? That's always exciting. Woo, a door of faith. Wow, Gentiles. Gentiles by the droves got saved through this door of faith. Woo, that's a great door. I want to show you the door. Look at Acts 14, verse 8 for a moment. Can I just tell you this, that doors of service are not always pretty? And can I also mention this, doors of faith are not always easy. 
doors of faith are not always easy. That's the thing about faith sometimes, isn't it? Acts 14, look at verse 8. Here we go, church. Now at Lystra there was a man sitting who could not use his feet. He was crippled from birth and had never walked. And he listened to Paul speaking. And Paul, looking intently at him and seeing that he had faith to be made well, said in a loud voice to this man, Stand upright on your feet. And that man, what did he do, church? And he sprang up and began walking. Woo! Man, that sounds like a good door, doesn't it? That sounds like an amazing door. How many people would have liked to have been there when that door opened? I'd have loved to have seen it. I'd have loved to have been there. Woo-hoo-hoo! Woo! But you know, that's not all that came with that door. Look at the 11th verse. Because you think everybody would be happy about that door of faith. Verse 11. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Laconian, The gods, lowercase g, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. Barnabas, they called Zeus and Paul Hermes because he was the chief speaker. And the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance to the city, bought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles Barnabas and Paul heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the crowd crying out, Men, why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you good news that you should turn from these vain things to a living God. Who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that is in them. In past generations, he allowed all the nations to walk in their own ways. Yet he did not leave himself without witness for He did good by giving you rains from heaven in fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Even with these words, they scarcely restrained the people from offering sacrifice to them. You know, something takes place right there. The attention begins to go to them. And they say, we're not worthy of it. Don't you dare do that to us. We... We're not worthy of that. We're not God. But let me tell you about God. Look at verse 19. But the Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and having persuaded the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing that he was what? Dead. They stoned that man so much that they thought he was dead. Verse 20. But when the disciples gathered about him, what did he do, church? He, He rose up. And entered the city. So he hadn't died. He rose up and entered the city. And on the next day he went on with Barnabas to Derbe. When they had preached the gospel to that city and had made many disciples. They returned to Lystra, to Iconium and to Antioch. Strengthening the souls of the disciples. Encouraging them to continue in the faith. And saying that through many tribulations. You see that? Through many what? Tribulations we must enter the kingdom of God. Of God. And when they had appointed elders for them in every church with prayer and fasting, they committed they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Stop right there for a moment, please, church. Paul and the others, and you gotta understand this man talking about the door, ain't always pretty. They stone the man, they take him away, he gets healed up. They're, they're, They're still preaching. Immediately they start preaching again. They go back to the same city where they had been treated so harshly and begin preaching the gospel again. How about that door to go through? How about that door? Can I tell you why they went back? Because the season was right. They went back because the season was right. Remember earlier what I told you, church? Man, the anointing today. Remember earlier what I told you? When God tries to sow seed, the devil shows up and tries to sow weeds. So Paul and Barnabas are out there. This man, crippled, begins to walk. Here comes the devil, which, by the way, threw Jews. And they're out there doing what they're doing to the point to where they stone him. They think he's dead, and they leave him alone simply because they think, aha, we got him, we killed him, he's gone. 
that blasphemer. And then all of a sudden, the disciples come around him. He wakes up. He gets up. They go to another town. They start preaching the gospel. They preach the gospel. They preach the gospel. When he's done there, hey, hey we got unfinished business. A door has been opened to us, to the Gentiles. And we need to go back and sow that living seed in water. We got to go through that door that God's opened. Write this down if you're taking notes. When God opens the door, go through it no matter what. The reason I say go through it no matter what is, again, because the enemy's going to try to keep you from going through a door that God's called you to go through. Sometimes it's going to be easy. Sometimes it's going to be hard. But when God opens a door and says go, you better go. Now, I want to show you something just in the 11th verse. If you'll look at Acts 14, verse 11. Acts 14, verse 11. I want you to see something. Acts 14, verse 11. And when the crowd saw what Paul had done, they lifted up their voices, saying in Laconian, the gods have come down to us in the likeness of men. And Barnabas they called Zeus, and Paul Hermes, because he was a chief speaker, and the priest of Zeus, whose temple was at the entrance of the city, brought oxen and garlands to the gates and wanted to offer sacrifice with the crowds. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of it, they tore their garments and rushed out into the, into the crowd, crying out, Men! And they're crying out to them, Men! Why are you doing these things? We also are men of like nature with you. And we bring you what, church? Good news. That you should turn from these vain things to a living God who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and, and that all that is in them. Can I just remind you of something in love? When you go through a, go a door that God has opened for you, it's not about you. It's about what God's doing through you. It's God's door, not yours. I've seen people go through doors of opportunity, man, and they try to own it. I've seen people go through doors of faith and they try to get, they let their head get swole up like it's their door. I've seen people preach word and be really good at preaching word, but they made it more about them than they made it about the season that they were in. Listen, I don't care what door it is. If God gave it, it's his door. He may have blessed you with the opportunity to walk through it, but that door is God's. It's kind of like when we build a home, as long as the builder's building it and it's under contract, that's his. Amen? He may say, no, that's mine. I'm paying for it. Yeah, well, when something messes up, who are you going to? That's his baby till you sign off on it. That's his baby because you and I can't do what that builder knows how to do. Amen? So it's his until the point that we start living in it. And then, let me teach you this. Once we start living in it, have you ever noticed that just about as soon as we live in it, we got to start maintaining it because stuff starts breaking down, don't it? Yep. If the builder had just kept it. See, sometimes I think we try to think, we try to take things out of God's hands. And when we take things out of the builder's hands, we begin to mess it up. When we take things out of the builder's hands, then all of a sudden, what we don't want to have happen is the builder, God, say, okay, son, okay, daughter, you think you got that? You go right ahead. I'll be here when you call on me. You take it and you break it. You take it and you break it. And we got to be really careful that we leave it in the builder's hands. God, this is your door, and I've prayed about walking through it, and I feel led by your spirit to follow you through it. So this is your door, and I'm going to trust you that I'm going to go through it. But the whole time I go through it, no matter what people say, if they try to build me up or swell me up or puff me up, no matter what goes on, Father God, I'm going to give you all the honor, glory, and credit, and praise because this is your door. I'm just blessed to walk through it. Yeah. This building, that new building, that's all God's. I'm just blessed to be able to have the opportunity to preach in it. Yeah. It's all God's. I want you to write down the following chapter and verse, and then in just a moment, not yet, but in just a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you stand. This is what I want you to write down, because we talked about a lot today with ministering to people and seasons and being in season and out of season. And 
Paul and Barnabas, they knew that the door of ministry was wide open, right? That's why they went back to the place that tried to kill them. Now, yes, it was the Jews trying to do it, that it came from outside, but it was still the same place where the people recognized them and where the people, the, 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 home, the hometown people were already upset with them because they didn't want, they wanted to be able to sacrifice their things, their ways, and Paul and Barnabas like, no, no, we ain't going to do that here, not to us. And the Spirit just took me to this, to this chapter and verse. Write this down. It's Joel chapter 3, verse 14. Joel chapter 3, verse 14. And, and that chapter is speaking about a, a, a judgment and things that are happening. But there's something that's mentioned that's really, really neat in that. I'm going to read it to you here. Joel chapter 3, verse 14 speaks of a valley of decision. Write that down if you're taking notes. A valley of decision. Joel 3, 14, a valley of decision. And this is what it says. Listen closely. Joel 3, 14. It says, multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision, exclamation mark multitudes multitudes in the valley of decision for the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision maybe there's some people in this room this morning and you're in that valley called decision and can I just say that maybe God has got you here through a exchange of events and whatever it is you came kicking screaming or polite whatever but you came and if you're not walking with Christ, can I tell you that this moment right here at 1152 on a Sunday in the beginning of September, this is your valley of decision right here, right now. And then there's some folks that, that are saved in the room, like myself, that I just want to make sure that I hear every word that God speaks to me. I want to make sure that my spirit is in line and and that I'm yielding to his spirit in every moment. And so my prayer today as someone who is already saved, Lord, in my valleys of decision, God help me hear clear. See, I've already been in the valley of decision for faith in Christ. I've already been in that valley. Oh my goodness, I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I'll never forget it. I will never forget that night when I just finally sold out and surrendered and said, God, can't do it no more by myself and I spent hours hours crying and overcome by the Holy Spirit and maybe most of you have heard it but for the some that haven't let me just let me just glorify God and honor God in this it was it was at a youth camp and I thought I was saved going into that camp I just graduated eighth grade and the truth is I followed a girlfriend at the time to that camp and I get there and I thought I was saved and in that moment that night the Holy Spirit hit me and I was slain in the spirit and the Lord showed me an incredible vision that I'll never forget and the next thing I know is that there was a janitor sweeping with one of those big brooms, shop brooms. And I come to from my vision and I look over to my side and I see this janitor coming through sweeping and he says, son, he says, everybody's gone, you gotta go. And he said, I've cleaned up this place and I gotta lock up. He says, you, you're welcome to go outside, to, you know, back to your cabin, but I, I've gotta lock up. I remember that guy helping me up and I remember him walking me helping me get outside man I was just so overcome by the spirit I remember him helping me get outside and there was a I'll never forget it there was a there was a, a mulch bed to my right that had those real big large stones built up in a wall and a retaining wall and and he took me and he set me up against that wall Because I was so overcome in that upper room moment that I didn't want to walk away from it. I knew who I was before that moment. And I didn't want to go back to that guy. I didn't want to go back to that guy ever again. Every weight, every burden, every sin, every filthy rag that I had in my life in that moment, it just got washed away. 
I remember sitting on that wall. And I remember being there for hours, weeping. Didn't know what to say, couldn't say anything, just weeping because the touch of the Lord had just met me in that moment. And maybe this morning there's some people in this room that need to experience the same type of touch. Because I'm just telling you the same God that touched me is the same God that's willing to touch you. Now I have not been perfect since that moment. I've made mistakes and I've been ugly and I have sinned. But man, I've got a redeemer that washes me and forgives me. And I've got, I've got a savior and I've got a Holy Spirit in me that keeps me from going back to that old guy again. It'll never be the same. It'll never be the same. Let's stand and pray together. We began this morning talking about some people in our lives that we've been praying for. And so I'd like to pray. I'd like to pray for some of those people. If you've got folks that you've been praying for in your life, people, children, grown folks, co-workers, family, spouses, I'd just like you to come on down here and, and I'm just going to say a, a prayer over you. And this is going to be my prayer for you now is that you'll know the season, that you'll know the season, that you will be made aware of the season to give that word. You'll be made aware of the season. You will know the season to give the seed and that you won't do it prematurely and have to work at it and have to try to save it and keep it moving. God doesn't need your hand in it. He just needs you to surrender. He just needs you to have faith. He just needs you to surrender. Now before I pray, I want to I wanna read you something. But maybe there's some people in this room today that feel like they're stuck behind a door. Maybe you went into what we talked about earlier. You went into Satan's door. You went into one of Satan's door of temptations. You went in right to one of Satan's doors of destruction. And, and you feel like ever since you've got wrapped up in that, you just feel like you've been arrested. That's, that's just the word I feel in my spirit this morning. You feel like you've been arrested by that door that you went in and you just can't shake the chains of bondage, of iniquity. You, you feel like it's just got you. Can, can, can I encourage you? Because this morning, this morning, the Holy Spirit gave me a word for you, if that's you. It's, it's found in Acts 5.19. And in Acts 5.19, this is what it says. But during the night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and bought them out and said, Go and stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. The 21st verse says that they went into the temple and began to preach. This was, this was a large handful of disciples at that moment in Scripture where they get taken and placed in prison because they've simply been preaching truth. They had done nothing wrong. They were just loving people. They were just helping people. But for some reason, they find themselves behind a door that they didn't belong behind. And an angel of God an angel from God showed up and he opens the door. I just want to remind you today, if you feel trapped behind a door from the enemy, can I just tell you this and give you this? God opens doors. He'll open doors that no man can shut and he'll close doors that no man can open. So if you're behind the door today that you just know I... This ain't, no, this ain't no longer for me. Can I just tell you, let God open it and walk out. Father, I pray for your people today in the name and the blood of Jesus Christ. Father, that today is a day that they've heard this message about doors. Doors of opportunity, doors of witness, doors of ministry, doors with your word. Doors where your truth can go forth. Hallelujah. Doors of salvation. And Lord, we lift up the loved ones, the family, the friends, the co-workers, bosses, management, supervisors, whoever it is, strangers. We just lift them up to you and we say, Father, may we always represent you at all times. 
showing your love and being true ambassadors of you. But there's moments, there's seasons where rebukes must be given. And Lord, we don't want to, we don't want to step out. We don't want to step out in, in front of you. So Father, I'm praying right now in the name and the blood of Jesus that as we pray for those people, that you would give us a knowledge in your, in your scripture, in your word, that you would give us a wisdom on how to give it. Father, I pray for every tongue and mouth in this room that they would be able to speak clearly. Speak clearly as Paul prayed, that they'd be able to speak clearly the truth and that the truth would be understood that comes up from their heart and out of their mouth. For out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. And can I just tell you that the Spirit is ministering to me? Maybe there's times, church, where, where we, try to, we try to speak from our mouth when our heart's not yet been full. We go into it with not all of what God wants to work with. And therefore, we can only give them pieces to the puzzle rather than the complete puzzle. Again, we're out of season. We're out of season. We've got to get the Word in us so that it wells up and overflows out of us that's the season we're looking for that's the season when you know it's right when you've got a word in you that's just bubbling up from deep down inside and you can't help but speak it because if you don't it just feels like your tongue has gone numb and and i've got to say this thing or i can't do anything else until i do Oh God, show your people. Show us, Father. Show us, Father. Show us, Father, what it looks like to be in season with the doors of faith and opportunity. Lord, I pray for that door of faith, that it would open in this community. In the name of the blood of Jesus, I pray that doors of faith would open up in this community. It would open up in our homes. It would open up, Father, in, in our families, at our jobs, at surrounding communities, Father. Open the door of faith, Father. Pour out your spirit upon these people, Father, your creation. And God, may we always recognize that this is your door. It's not ours. And we are blessed to be able to go through those doors. If there's anyone in this room that has not yet received Jesus Christ and you've heard what I've talked about today and you say, Pastor, I may not have understood all of it, but I understood some of it. And what I have understood is, is that I need Jesus in my life right now. I feel like there's something just moving inside of me and I've never felt it before. I don't know what's going on, but I recognize that I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Can I just tell you, not only is he a door, not only is he a door, Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one, no man comes to the Father except through the Son. So if you're here today, the good news for you is, is that the first door you need to walk through has got a name. And his name is Jesus Christ. So if you're here today and you say, I want to ask Jesus to be in control of my life. I want to surrender to Jesus. I don't know everything that that means yet. And that's okay, you won't. But if, you, if you're willing to say, I need Jesus to save my soul and, and I want to be a Christian and I want to live for him and honor him, if that's you, just raise your hand if that's you. I don't want to miss anybody, so don't you put it down until I see you. Anybody, anybody that says, I need that. I need that in my life. I need that. I need that. I don't want you to leave this place without talking to someone who is saved if you've got questions. Lord, honor your people as we have honored you today. God, I pray that we take what we've learned and we would please you with it because we would be obedient to the truth. Lord, I pray that this day, this afternoon, this evening, and this night that's coming would just be so refreshing to your people because it really has been a gift from you. And we say thank you for that gift. In the name and the blood of Jesus, all God's people say, Amen. Let's give God a clap of praise. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 Before you leave, before you leave, if I can get Brother Eric, where's Eric Moore?